right, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Colin Howard. We're at Day Wines in Dundee. It's uh, July 26, 2022. Colin, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Rich. Uh, first question to get you started is why wine? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, you know, I, I thought about this, which is uh, maybe for a lot of American winemakers, the, the how and the why is kind of intertwined because, um, for me at least, you have to discover wine before you, you decide you, you are you're committing to this or, or taking that adventure. So, you know, we don't grow up in, in a place where, well, not, at least I didn't grow up on the East Coast. It wasn't an obvious uh, pathway. So you have to find it and then sort of wonder what it's all about. And it's different than the obvious jobs you might go to school for and things like that. So, uh, yeah, you don't really pick it off a shelf. You, you, you come across it and then it, it sticks to you. Um, which I'm, I'm very happy it did, but it, it, it came about through multiple steps, I think, over, over time. Um, so uh, maybe the answer to the question why I, I stick with it is that it, it's this exciting way of, of um, that humans, there are many that humans have decided to use their instincts and creativity to take nature and make it a way to celebrate being on, on the earth, it's a strange mm -hmm. place that we're on where you, you have many options and you could say music or, you know, um, art or cooking or yeah, who knows, any artistic expression, you're able to immediately engage with this natural product and say, my God, something exciting has happened and it's a great way to, to share with people and say, you know, we get to have a good time. Mm -hmm. um, by being here. So that, that's a really nice aspect of it. After all the hard work, people turn around and it's in a bottle and they say, that was, th this is wonderful. Like, I'm so glad this uh, wine exists or this, you know, this wine festival or, you know, just be coming to the taste room here, things like that. Mm -hmm. It's a nice feeling, so. Well, then on that case, let's ask, let's ask how wine then. So tell me how yeah. wine came into your life. You mentioned growing up on the East Coast. Tell me about where you where you were born and raised, and how? at what point wine found you? Yeah, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, um, in the city, and then uh, at about 11 or 12, my folks moved out to the county, and uh, went to a really nice school out there, and uh, called Hereford High School, and met some friends, um, well, became friends, the Bostonianis, and they have a, a winery in northern Baltimore County. Uh, called Bastiani Winery, and I started, uh, I mean, I, I was just friends with, with the kids of the family and then started coming over, and obviously their backyard was this huge vineyard, and they had this beautiful old brick and stone um, kind of built into the hillside winery. Um, very, you know, it, it was very bucolic and very, uh, uh, you know, uh, postcard-esque kind of scene, and uh, in middle school, it didn't really make an impression other than it was really fun, but uh, in high school and then through college, uh, mostly through college, my friends and I, a few of them started working in the vineyards uh, as summer jobs. I mean, it was kind of, uh, maybe this speaks to the, my, you know, what we were talking about before, the longer mission of wanting a summer job that didn't really feel like work, even though it was an incredible amount of work. But I was outside driving a truck, hanging out with five border collies, um, you know, and just what are we doing today? We go prune these vines. We're digging holes for deer fence posts. We're, um, God, who knows what? I mean, it was like, I, I didn't work as much in the winery to start as, as like the teenage years. So every so often it would be like, you know, Mike needs hand, a hand with washing the barrels. So you might come down for a day and then you get to creep into this, you know, sort of more mysterious area and start helping. And then um, I, I would, I'll slip a, a, a little, trip in there, which I think had this very long and slow impact on me, which was in, you know, I took Spanish in school and, and they got some of the, you know, like higher level Spanish and French students together for a, a trip in the summer of uh, 1997 or so. And we, I don't know, maybe it was like 15, 16 different kids from my school. We joined with another local high school and landed in Madrid first and then spent like three weeks in between Spain and France and all that. And, you know, I, I was really just having a wonderful time and wine kept sort of showing up. Um, 
with dinner, uh, with sitting on the beach, uh, and you know, someone would just pop a bottle. And I've never experienced that. You know, uh, um, you know, sneak beer or whatever <laughs> you get your hands on in co- in high school. But now it was appearing as this um, sort of like I was saying, either a way to say like, now let's enjoy this. You know, this meal needs a way to be enhanced and it wasn't just like let's drink as much as we can or it's like you have a little sip like your grandma would have these you know the people i was around were really making it um known that it, it was essential and it was exciting and so that kind of like i think hit me and then didn't really um i couldn't put it into tangible terms for myself until years later you know what what that trip they're probably, I still think about that trip, you know, um, especially if I hadn't done it, you know, w- w- would I be able to compare other options to say, but you can reach out here and have this kind of, mm-hmm. of path or career and, and just a way of seeing the world, you know? And so uh, when I came back, um, it, it didn't really do much for my career path. I, I was still very interested in sciences. So I went to the University of Vermont for environmental sciences, you know, some biology and land management stuff. It was kind of a mix of different, uh, you know, liberal arts kind of <laughs> science study, things like that. Um, but I knew when I came out, I wasn't going to be a, a scientist in the sense that, uh, you know, my other, other options I saw were like counting the diameters of trees and then putting that in an Excel sheet and then making that into, a, you know, this the aggregate of numbers and then that information would be tremendously important to like the forestry department and BLM, but I couldn't do it. Like I almost physically couldn't do it for more than a week. I, I would start to just, you know, my brain would ignore it. And so, um, you know, I came back and I, and I got a really terrible lab job in my hometown in Baltimore and, and immediately, almost immediately, several months later called uh, Bert Bastiani, who, who was the owner there, and, and was just saying, hey, look, I will I liked what we were doing. Can I come back? And first week, he's like, oh, may I get you 20 hours? And then at the end of that week, he's like, just keep showing up. Well, you know, I like having you here, I think. And so I stayed there for about maybe two or three, two and a half, three years. Um, and really uh, just got sucked into it I, you know I don't I don't remember a moment but I remember I had other options and I kept thinking but I want to do the next harvest but I, we, we have to we have to build that fence for the new vineyard we have you know all this stuff and so I kept um, getting more excited about what was happening and then when I think I realized that you know did I know for my, the rest of my life what I would do not necessarily at 24 but I was going to give it a go you know and thought well I really can't I could, but I, I didn't want to do it on the East Coast. I wanted to really try something on a, you know, I guess maybe a little more national scale or maybe have that organic vineyard uh, experience is more of an option. It's very hard on the East Coast to, to do organic vineyards. Or maybe impossible, I don't know, <laughs> unless you're working with, um, you know, hybrids and things like that and even still. So anyway, I, I, I had thought about California and I thought about um, uh, Oregon. I hadn't been to Oregon yet, and, but that age, you know, you know, I don't know, you don't have a lot of fear and you really want to adventure more than anything else. So, you know, it wasn't just wine, it was um, being out on, on my own, you know, mm-hmm. trying a, a new town and, and, and all kinds of things. And, um, and so I just went, you know, I drove across the country and, and ended up out here and had some conversations where people were like, you know, in the wine industry were saying, look, Oregon's going to be your place, it's going to be the place. And that was very helpful as well to hear that from some folks. So, um, yeah, ended up out here and got a job with the Carl Winemaker Studio. It's a sort of a shared intern to a degree, but made some quick relationships with like Ray Walsh. Um, when he was there, and um, uh, a good friend of mine, Greg McClellan, who's at, at Methvin and does Suzer and things like that. So, you know, there was a bond with a lot of people there um, very, very quickly. And at that, that was 2005. It was sort of a, you know, like a kids' club feeling then. I think, you know, Eric Homaker, I think, was, you know, the main brand and also part of the, 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 
the trajectory for the whole place mm -hmm. and and um, you know he's no authoritarian so he he was very nice and kept a very loose vibe and um, you know at that he was one of the first guys I talked to when I was back east who was like this is gonna be exciting have a great time so he really kind of got me pumped up too mm -hmm. and, and um, yeah, it was great um, a great trip yeah, I was there for about eight months and then you know sort of a what now uh, am I going to do and, and at kind of at the last minute I got a job at Erath uh, which lasted a year um, and that was, that was that was my sort of um, you know cutting all the baby fat experience off because it's such a big uh, production and it's also not built for it so you're doing a lot of work outside I mean I remember my like trying to use the bulldog and my hands were just kind of frozen and uh, working on those tanks outdoors and you know racking hundreds of barrels at a time so um, yeah it was it, it got me really up to speed on on being very efficient and very focused all day long instead of just like you know we do a little bit of this and then the rest of the day is taking it easy and it was just all it was full force all the time um, and then uh, from there it's interesting uh, it kind of zigzags in a, in a very helpful way, um, my career path. So um, Ray had had said, hey, this company out of California, Wine Secrets, wants someone to do some some cross flow and electrodialysis and, and, and VA removal and things like that. And at that point, I um, didn't know that much about it, you know, and, and, and I'm glad I, I did take that job because, um, you know, while you know, may not, not everything they did like fit in with a winemaking philosophy that I, I would eventually go towards. Um, the idea of going from anywhere from like Canada, I was up in Summerland and Okanagan area down to Napa and Oregon and Washington and sitting down with all those winemakers who were either, you know, had a problem that they needed to fix or were saying, you know, with things like cross flow electrodialysis, this is an improvement, this is an energy improvement. It's, um, you know, better for the wine, better for, you know, like the electrodialysis used in, in cold stabilization, right? Or the same process, but you do it in a day versus several weeks of, of chilling. And um, so just learning about that and seeing that done, sort of getting to go right behind the scenes with a lot of winemakers all up and down the, the coast um, and learn about their experience and what, what had got them to the point that they were at, whether it be a problem or a, a better solution was, you know, it's sort of irreplaceable. It's like, <laughs> you, you, I went from being, you know, kind of on my own with my, you know, my mother cellar hand buddy to all up and down the coast within a week um, talking to people every day. So that was huge. Um, Wine Secret started to focus more on California. So I, I needed, you know, more full-time work. And at that point, um, I, I knew that House Spirits, uh, which is now Westward Whiskey or Westward Distillery, um, needed distillation help, and and it was you know I knew Christian from he used to be the general manager at the winemaker studio, so I got on there in production. So I switched to distilling for a while. Uh, was the head distiller there for you know it took me a while to to, to um, get up to speed with distillation and sort of study that science a little more. You know, it was more chemistry based and, and chemistry wasn't always my favorite. <laughs> it's a little rough. Um, but once you have an outcome because of the chemistry, it's a lot easier to, to like it and care about it and understand it. Um, and that was great. I mean, the, especially in those, you know, earlier kind of more independent days, like working with Aviation Gin and doing the, the, uh, the coffee liqueur recipe and doing a rum recipe and and um, you know some of those early batches of whiskey were, were great because we were working with all these different brewers because we didn't have a um, you know a full um, a brewing setup or anything like that um, and that got me up to speed on whiskey and then uh, at that point my wife and I decided to, to try and open a wine bar and we did uh, and that was called Oso Market uh, that was on Southeast Grand, right next to Digapony. And, uh, you know, I've been friends with Aaron Hall, who, who was one of the co-owners of Digapony for a long time. Um, 
and uh, you know, he said the space is opening up. Um, what do you think? And and um, I was like, oh, I think I should. It would be fun to give it a shot. And it, and it was, and it was incredibly uh, hard, you know, owning a business, and especially one that's sort of you know niche. You 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 were, were doing a little mix of retail and and food and small plates and wine and, and all this stuff and really focusing on uh, well it was it was a kind of a mix of European and local wineries but trying to find those wineries that I think we're, we're you know excited about now and some that are you know more veterans now but doing things differently than just the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay um, which of, of course is what brought me out here but as you're seeing it bubble up it's exciting to, to share those things with people mm -hmm. right um, so that's how I got to know Brienne, right? So I, I uh, would pour a lot of her wine, um, and uh, you had had her do some tasting events and things like that. I think like one of her first vintages of Mamacita, she came in and opened it there, and uh, um, it's kind of exciting because she's like, this one might blow up. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it, it didn't. It made a little bit of a mess, but it, it tasted amazing. So, uh, but yeah, the early days of, of of her, um, you know, pushing that that Petnat project forward. Now it's you know doing quite well. So um, you know, I stayed in touch with her. I even talked to her about maybe making like an Oso branded wine, um, but it just got too too much work, and and I, I wasn't really making money, which is something you need to to keep your own life going. And you know, I could have found ways to to find more investment, things like that. But I think I kind of didn't want to go down with the ship. You know, I did it, it went for about three years. Um, and I spent time thinking about, you know, every project has a shelf life and what have I gotten out of this? And, and if I separate myself from this, you know, do I feel accomplished or is this, or is my identity this thing? Do I need to save both mm -hmm. at the same time? And I decided not to. Um, and but it was great. I still hear from people who who enjoyed it there, and 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 um, was one of their favorite places to drink wine, and that's really great. Um, so yeah, the education in wine globally continued to grow, and I think that's where going back to that the idea of that that high school trip, it was an expression of that, where it was like, remember the, these time like these sort of back alley. In a back alley, but like these little <laughs> side alleys in in Paris and Madrid or wherever else, where you see this this thing happening, you didn't totally understand this sort of maybe cafe lifestyle to sum it up, and and trying to bring some of that um, to your hometown, you know, it was fun, and, and um, yeah, did a little more restaurant work uh, for a couple more years at the Whiskey li Multnomah Whiskey Library, and then. Um, as I was already looking to get back into winemaking, um, and when, when right around the time that COVID was hitting, I was starting to look around, and then it did hit, and I had a lot of time to to figure something out, and quickly quickly ended up here because um, yeah, Brian needed help. So, and we we'd known each other. Um, I understood, um, you know, her excitement and her creativity, and and. Um, and her drive, and, and it matched up with what I, I wanted to do instead of, um, you know, maybe returning to a traditional Oregon style. I, I, I like that it was open ended, and that, that um, there was that um, just that creativity built into the system. It, was, it really makes a difference for me. So, yeah. Well, and I, so now we're here. You know, of course, I'm um, working with Brianne, this winemaker here, and 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 the brand Mendivia has been definitely in the back of my mind for quite a while. Mendivia is uh, a Spanish boss name from my my father's side. Um, that um, just I'll say didn't really make it through uh, immigration in a way. It's honestly quite a long story, um, but. Uh, it, uh, it's a chance for me to, to shed some light on it and get, kind of give it new breath and things like that. And that's a beautiful name as well. Um, and I think my excitement for Spanish wines is one of the, the areas that first got me excited in, in wine or, or kind of felt a little bit like my own to agree because everyone knew French wine or was, you know, that's mm -hmm. how you get introduced a lot. 
And as I discovered these Spanish wines, it yeah, felt a little bit like a, a cool secret you're finding out about. You know, what, what is Priora? Why, you know, why do these wines taste so different than anything else? And same with, um, you know, La Rioja and, and, and uh, Galicia and, and, you know, and you can obviously get into Sherry and Canary. You know, things just keep unfolding, but they all felt sort of shrouded, um, especially 15 years ago or something like that, for me anyway, at that age, you know. Um, so the the family connection um, to the country and then also just my my love and appreciation for Spanish wine in that way um, is what's well you know major inspiration for putting Mandivia um, you know will bring it to life and putting it in a bottle um, and the um, I guess. I was just trying to think of uh, any family connections in winemaking, which I think it really was only um, mostly some grandfathers and great-grandfathers making stuff in the basement. Uh, maybe a little more on the Italian side, too, which is on my mother's side. But um, yeah, it's just drawing those two things together. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to back up a little bit. I want to kind of take you through the, the, all the steps you just yeah. laid out for us there. So uh, you mentioned. Oregon was for you kind of a possibility, uh, you know, a, a, a place that could could go big. You could, you could do something there. And uh, tell me about your initial impressions of Oregon and, and of the industry, especially the first couple of years working in the winemaker studio, working at Erath. What did you think of Oregon, and what did you think of the of the industry that was here at that time? Yeah, uh, of Oregon in general. I mean, I showed up in the summer, and it was beautiful. I mean, it was almost um, disorienting how cloudless and blue and non-humid each day was back to back. I'd never really experienced anything like that over and over and over again. So um, it was really awesome and, re and a, little, a little odd at first, yeah, but it was beautiful, you know? Mm -hmm. And like each day you walk out, it's like 80 degrees and, and clear skies and you can ride your bike anywhere if you wanted to. So from just a, a living perspective, I loved, I loved it and then um, Harvest sort of takes over your life for a while, and that was just exciting. I mean, the, the studio was a really fun place to to learn and observe and, and ask questions, and, and just the view. I mean, from the crush pad with the uh, you know the sunsets and the clouds rolling over the coast range. I mean, it was very, it really just got me excited. I mean, it, it, it was the right age and the right time for me to. to just be dropped in the middle of this place and you're making new friends. You know, everyone's new and everything is new and it was really fun. Um, and then the rain, you know, the rain hit and it was like one of the rainiest winters, I think, that Oregon had had in a while. Or I remember them saying like, it's been like 30 some days in a row and Seattle's at like 35, six, uh, just constant rain. So that was another shock of, of like, oh, you have to find a way to um, get your mind right for the winter here, you know? and. It, because where I grew up, you know, you get terrible snows or ice storms, and then a couple of days later, it's sun, you know, the sun's mm -hmm. out might be cold, it might even be 25 degrees, but you have the sun on you. And so um, figuring out how to deal with the lack of sun was, uh, it was hard. Yeah. I mean, not like, it was just a surprise, I'll say. Yeah. Um, and then with Oregon, I, you know, the, the wines to me were, were very inspiring, um, and you know, Pinot Noir was still you know uh, newish, but it was like in a early level of of maturing in 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 the valley. So when when you had a bottle of wine that you know was you know one of the best vintages or from one of the best producers, and you could taste that potential, it was just kind of put wind in your sails, you're like, this is, you know, this is why I'm, I'm here, or, you know, maybe one day you get, you know, you get your, your, your chance at that. It just felt like there was this great horizon um, to, to, to reach towards, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's, you know, it's not easy to leave your hometown, but when you start to see some, some uh, inspiration for that, like, oh, this is, this is really, this is good wine. This is, a, you know, there's a lot of running room here, and mm -hmm. so, I felt excited to be here and, and in Portland. You know, you know, I was driving. I still do drive back and forth, but um, I love them both. You know, I was having a lot of fun, like working all 
all day at the winery and then going back up to town and you know going to shows and finding exciting places to hang out like it was just a great time so you talked about the second vintage though when you went to Erath yeah. and being kind of the like welcome to reality sort of moment yeah. for you so tell me about that uh, we've heard lots of stories about making wine in that facility at various times uh, obviously a challenge uh, logistically so tell me about the the takeaways from that and if the first year was kind of the like opening your eyes to the potential and inspiration what was it about the second year that made you want to keep doing it despite the sort of the challenges that were introduced yeah well for a little context too I, I split kind of the six months or what six months where Dickey Rath still owned it and, and then six months where Chateau St. Michel uh, came in and purchased the facility so that uh, a transition like that's always a little bit rough um, and like I'm saying it, it it was uh it was it was grueling there I mean not in in a way that I didn't always welcome it but it's uh it's a big operation and and um you know that harvest in particular was was it was 2006 it was warm it was hot so just a lot of fruit I mean I think I worked every day for about almost three months straight close to you know maybe one or two days off so um yeah, it pushes you to that point of, of like, do you like doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. And and is this, it, it, what are the other options to the side as well that, that are, are could be a better fit? Not that that, that Erath isn't a, a good fit for Block, but I mean, it's, a, it's an iconic winery, you know? And, um, but I, I think for me, having just come from that, that small production thing to that, it just allows you to ask yourself the question, like, okay, where, where, where is my uh, fit? And, and then, um, you know, coming out of it, you don't always realize at the time, but that, that, that constant flow of, of wine and, and racking, and even just like, you know, getting, let's say 300, 400 barrels stacked four high in a, in a warehouse and then trying to, like, you have to get to the one all the way in the back and put, like, all that forklifting and it's pouring rain and you're, you know, trying to sort it all out, um, you know, it just kind of whittles you down in, in a good way. You know, sometimes you're exhausted, but you um, get a lot of skills that, that you can take other, other places just by being, you know, pushed really hard. So it was kind of, you know, kind of boot camp-esque <laughs> in a way. Um, but uh, yeah, did, I don't know what other question, I, I, if I missed it about Erath, did you have? I'm or, sort of curious, yeah. like it, you mentioned like that was a much, much more difficult and much more taxing. Yeah. So coming out of it, what made you want to keep doing it? What made you want to stick around wine uh, rather than, you know, running the other direction? What was it that kept you like in, in, interested and engaged in it? It was probably still mostly the, the memory of, um, of the, some of the winemakers I'd met at at um, at the studio, mm -hmm. and I, I think just you know you, at that age also you're you're resilient and you you know you just kind of keep going and you're like it's gonna keep keep working out and and I think you know I was meeting people who had I, I don't know if these exactly overlap but you know uh, uh, Patrick Ruder at uh, from Domino Four at at, he was at the Carmel Winemaker Studio then. Um, I thought it was just brilliant, you know, just a wonderful guy. And his wines were interesting and fantastic. And he was making Tempranillo, which of course uh, I like, and, and Syrah, and his labels said things that I didn't even fully understand. You know, I was like, I didn't know you could say whatever you felt on a, a which might sound naive, you know, but at that age too, I was like, he's just putting his thoughts or poetry or something on the label. It's like, this is just cool, you know? He, he was having a good time and he had a really relaxed and mature attitude uh, towards winemaking. Um, guys like Jay Summers, uh, who I did a harvest with too, um, with Jay Christopher. Um, you know, him and I um, also, he's a much better guitar player than I am, but bonded over, you know, most of our conversations were about music, but just watching him make wine and things like that, you know, um, these things all help me stay on track. Not that I necessarily have been knocked off track, but yeah, you, you get a chance to say, well, okay, well, you know, what just happened? <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of, um, you know, in, intensity and 
might not have been what I was looking for. But, you know, you quickly refine it, maybe just by actively seeking or running into more like-minded people. And you see, oh, there's these operations. And, you know, every so often coming on the hill, just popping into to Cameron and seeing Tyson there with, with Jean Paul, you're like, this is pretty nice. This is cool, you know. And we just we we went over there the other day as um, as a team for a day just to visit, and you know, still smells and looks the same, and and in the best way, and it was it was delightful. So, yeah, um, somewhere in between all those is you know you, you you're always searching for your. I don't know if you're searching for a comfortable spot, something exciting, you know, your exciting spot. So. Um, but yeah, you don't really, it's easier to find it what, or recognize it when you hit those limits too. So mm -hmm. ERETH was just kind of one of those limits I bumped up against. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was, it was a good place and, and um, I definitely got a lot better at doing a lot of work and, and accurately um, than I would have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've got to be thankful for that. So you mentioned from there, uh, Wine Secrets was kind of the next big stop for you. So uh, we've heard a little bit about Wine Secrets, but give, me, give us an idea of what, what exactly kind of the, 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 the mission of the place is. And you mentioned sort of your role in getting to know people and figuring out maybe solutions to problems. What was it that you were looking for and, and offering, and, and I guess and learning and offering at that point? Yeah, I mean, I think the, to be honest, like the initial attraction was an interesting thing I can do and move on, right? Um, so that, uh, and we will move on from that as well, but I, I got that opportunity and I trusted Ray, you know, and, and was excited by the, the team when I met them. You know, That's they, Ray they, Walsh. Yeah, Ray yeah. Walsh. So he was more of a consultant, but um, he introduced me to Eric Dahlberg and, and Domingo Rodriguez, who were the guys running the show at that time down there. I think Eric still owns the company. Um, and what I liked is they weren't just approaching it as technicians. They wanted to bring energy efficiencies to wineries. They wanted to um, help winemakers out of tricky spots and understand how to avoid them too. So what you know, they they had really good science backgrounds and were interested in in helping wines, you know, improve and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, it, it some of the things that, of the projects were, you know, they'd be rough on a wine, but it was better than, it was a way to salvage wine. So, it, you know, some of the processes worked better for a larger winery where you could, you know, if you had a batch that the VA went out of control, you could sort of bring it back into the crowd a little bit and then blend it away, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think sometimes some winemakers, you, you maybe less than the VA and then all of a sudden another problem that was behind that would pop up because VA is very intense and, and it can hide a lot of things so um, that was another learning watching just knowing that that you know when a wine takes off in the wrong direction a lot of things can be tucked and woven into so mm -hmm. really keeping that 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 close eye the waiting to do the right thing at the right moment for the wines but not also controlling it you know so that it, it has no excitement in it mm -hmm. right um, so that was a good way to learn that that sort of slightly nervous energy you have to have in winemaking where it's like well what is it you know what just because it's good today doesn't mean I can go on vacation you know like next week could be like you have to kind of have a sense for the arc of certain batches of wine and things like that where they're going so um, yeah I mean that that was that and travel and I th I think just the opportunity to learn a lot all at once I mean I do remember thinking man I'm gonna get to talk to all these people and and you know I think I'd been itching for more education at a higher rate at, at that at that age so how, how was I gonna get that you know um, here was a great door open and mm -hmm. you know someone I trusted had mentioned it to me or brought me to it so um, yeah I didn't put too much thought into it actually I just thought well, this would be really fun I mean it isn't it isn't you know my career but like it's a couple of years it's not a you know 
can always come back into the winery, which is, of course, what I did. So, so before I kind of move on to the, the, the sort of non-wine part of this, I'm curious about, you mentioned uh, sort of starting to develop like a winemaking philosophy, sort of starting to develop how you'd like to make wine. And of course, Wine Secrets is obviously kind of maximal intervention and fixing problems. And so tell me about at that point in your life, what was your kind of preferred? If, if, if you were making your own wine or if you were at a project that was your, under your control, what would your style have been? What did you find yourself attracted to at that time when it came to wine and wine making? Yeah, and I, for me, I think it did, it did start in the vineyard, which I, I felt really lucky to have started there in the first place. And so as I got older and started to, to for a period of time get separated from the vineyard. You know, most of the jobs are either one or the other. Uh, and I noticed the, this, the, the lack of, the lack of the vineyard. And so I started to, you know, kind of tilt my mind towards wine. Wine is, is food. It's, a, it's, it, it's, it's something on a table. It wants to join with the other things on the table. And it's, it's best expression comes when or from the vineyard so it's showing its best when it's expressing something from that that vineyard and you don't get in the way of that right so I think the philosophy started with that which is what am I what am I making what am I asking to make like um, I I want to help bring something to that that table right that like ever moving table of enjoyment and celebration, you know, I, I mean, it, I hope that doesn't sound cheesy, but it's like, it's a lot better than a table that doesn't have those things on, you know what I mean? So <laughs> when people, you know, you start, started going to restaurants that had these foods that just tasted like um, the most brilliant, you know, expressions of that, you know, that pizza or that, um, you know, those grilled vegetables or whatever it might be, you've never had something like that and the wine goes with it and you don't, it's easy to get excited about when you start to wonder why it, it tastes so good and you know, you, you start reading, they're mentioning farms on menus and, and, and so that sense of place is, is starting to become very important and mm -hmm. you're seeing it more and more and where the animals are raised and, and things like that. And, um, so it went from just words and more to like, you, you, you have to really not get in the way of the vineyard as the winemaker. Um, which, you know, sounds simple, but it's, uh, you got a lot of options as a winemaker, you know, and you're also making something you're trying to sell, right? So th there's a lot of ways to keep it on a tight rail or uh, things like that, but it, it's, it's more exciting to try and get that, that vineyard character in front of the fruit, you know, um, and, and, or in front, of the, in front of the customer through the fruit and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the philosophy is not too complex, um, but hopefully shows up in, in an exciting way in the glass, which is that, you know, we, we live in a, a beautiful area and very lucky to, and, and as, you know, we discover new areas, and even as the climate changes, new expressions um, come out and, and uh, just don't get in the way, mm -hmm. you know. And, but also trust your training, you know. Like the, uh, if the wine sort of is saying it needs help with the ferment, you know, pay attention. You can, mm -hmm. you can, you can kind of bring it back home. So, yeah. It's an interesting perspective talking about like how, how not getting in the way seems very simple, but but it really isn't because of all the options you have. So. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm curious about that in practice. How how often do you have to pull yourself back from something, or or say, or or, or let something go that you think you could, you should you should have to fix? Yeah, I mean, I I, I, th I think more often it's either not doing what you you think you need to do, or you, you're waiting. So, you know, a lot of a lot of the things are um, that you're you're paying attention to, or you know aromas in, in a fermentation when that's happening and um, some that comes down to uh, you know temperature or pump over or punch down to go oh, what is the best thing at the right time and then when wine is in the barrel 
you know, you might taste or, or and think it's finished um, all its, you know, mallow and, and primary and things like that. Um, and it may not be. And I think using science, you know, using scientific results to, to help you make wise choices, which sometimes can be leaving it alone, you know, um, is, it makes, it makes it seem simple because now like you, you, you have uncertainty and that cloud can cloud your decision making. Um, but by using, you know, every year, it, it is a repetitive cycle, but you fall into, to, you know, patterns of uh, antsiness and, and wanting the wine to do what it did last year. And we still have white wines that are still creeping through Mallow. And last year, the white wines blew through everything and the reds took light. You know, and this year, like some of the punchins were finished months before the barrels, which I, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. <laughs> but so everything flips each time. And, and it, I think it's that being attentive, but, but avoiding pattern or avoiding, um, uh, you know, your, your thinking that your thoughts will control what the wine is doing, which of course is silly, but you, you do want it to be a certain way and the wine does not know that. It's just going whichever directions it's going in. So you are reading information off that wine and trying to figure out, well, what is the, what's sort of the fulcrum point for the next step? You know, and those next steps are really important. Like if, if you, if Mallow finished months ago and you're just thinking, oh, it's still hanging out, you could lose a really great wine and now it's, you know, mm -hmm. sort of flat or something. But that's, uh, I, I guess to your question, that's it, just knowing when it's time to make the, the informed decision, mm -hmm. right? So um, if, all, if everything's fermenting well, you don't have that much to worry about, so take it easy on yourself. You know, you'll need that energy later. <laughs> so. so you mentioned next you, you sort of stepped away from wine and distillation. Uh, compare them for me. I'm curious about, uh, in your practice, uh, between winemaking and, and spirit, making spirits, uh, how are they similar and, and what, are the, what are the differences between the, the, the two practices? Yeah, um, well, one of the big similarities is um, is the skill in, in blending flavors, you know. Um, with, with spirits, especially with whiskey, you know, you have, same with wine, you have all these barrels and they're, they're reacting to the wine and the temperature and, and uh, possibly even the different fermentation, uh, you know, profiles and things like that. Um, so that, that skill of, of trying to um, figure out not just you know what what goes together and tastes good but what what can taste great if you set contrasting flavors or almost like fill in notes mm -hmm. you know in a musical sense because um, you, you know you can have five really good barrels and you put them together and they taste really good still but you can have you know three of those and one's dark one's spicy and one's like you know this strawberry fruit and all of a sudden you've got something much more complex so I think um, always keep that door open in the blending process until you're really like okay this is actually this is the end you know we got there because um, you, you know you you want to um, with blending I think it's a patience that you don't always use all day long mm -hmm. it's sort of meditative you just sit there and and just chip away at it and then say, well, what if I took that one out? Oh, what would happen? So that, was, that really helped a lot. Um, one of the differences would be every year with wine, you, know, you wait with wine, but then everything is just given to you with sort of a, a built-in pathway, like from the vineyard, right, we're talking about, or the weather. And so you get this yearly sort of explosion of creativity and, and, and sort of hyperactivity and wondering where everything's going and doing your best to, to make the best wine you can. With, with distillation, you have this period of, of recipe development and that's exciting and then you just repeat it <laughs> all the time, um, which isn't, isn't that bad, especially when people like what, what you're doing, mm -hmm. but you aren't thinking, well, next year I'll just do another gin recipe and I'll do another one after that or I'll keep tweaking this one. Mm -hmm. um, you see that with spirits where um, 
if you don't open with a good recipe or a good blend, but you keep changing it, bartenders or even just customers are like, well, what is the, like how do I re relate to this brand? And that's much more of a common thing in spirits where it's like, is this kind of, is this my, my style whiskey? Is this my style mm -hmm. Amaro or gin or whatever? And so you've, you've got to hopefully open with something good and then you got to stick to it, you know? And you know, you look at like, let's say like Tangeray, which now has maybe four different gins, maybe five um, that I know of on the US market. They might have all kinds of UK things that I don't even know about, but they've been around a long time and they just are just releasing, you know, a few new things in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, this is what Tangeray tastes like, you know, and then Tangeray 10 comes along a while after. And then this Rang Per thing, which is brilliant, comes out. But, you know, they've, they've got the money and the talent to probably pump something out every month. And that, that need to stay true to your, your brand and, and, and your, your flavor brand and spirits is so crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with wine, you know, each year we're like, this is what Johan Vineyard tastes like. And it's, it's you know, it, it, it's always gonna have something Johan about it, but it, it changes with the, the climate and the year and all those things. So, mm -hmm. and that's why I think people like wine. It's one of the main reasons, right? So mm -hmm. um, that's a big difference for sure. Especially in Oregon, with the, with the vintage variation, right? Yeah, 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 and 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 this sort of mix of heat and smoke, and and now this year with frosts and early rains, um, it's very, it's, you know, it stresses you out. <laughs> chaos, <laughs> like chaos. obviously, I think it's obvious. I try to stay, uh, you know, keep a cool head when I have the opportunity. But this is something that if if you yeah, you can let it get to you with with this is smoking every year thing. It's like, God, what? I'm trying to dodge everything else and, and then it's, you know, someone tips over their fire cigarette butt in the woods, you know, hundreds of miles from you and like, that's the end of that. So, yeah, can happen. But fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, man. It's a lot, a lot of nature to be controlled there. The <laughs> it, it's a thing you look controlled. at and you're like, my God, it's a lot of woods. I hope someone's <laughs> being good out there, yeah. And yeah, I mean, you can see, see how fast things dry up. You know, this, when heat like we have right now comes around, I mean, it, your lawn can go from sort of green to just dead in two days, mm -hmm. you know, and, and think about that for millions of acres. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. how do you control that? I don't know. So you talked about while you were while you were not doing wine, while you were doing distillation, and other things. You were wine was always there, or something you wanted to come back to. So, uh, what about this opportunity was the thing that brought you back? Yeah, it it was knowing, you know, from knowing Bria, knowing the the creativity that she sort of demanded for herself. You know, I, now working with her, I I, I know that it, it's. I mean, it's really, it's like a, it's a lifestyle choice. Like, I think if we're like, we'll, we'll just, we'll tailor it back and we'll make it, you know, more, you, you know, like the whole place would have a manual kind of thing. It, it wouldn't be as exciting for her and probably not me either. Um, so that, the, it, but this, I mean, we, we have a lot of, of attention to detail and structure is just sort of that it's allowed to move from each project to project as we get excited about. So it's like, at first and foremost, the excitement behind each wine has to be there. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, and so knowing that, I think it, it was a very easy fit. It was a natural fit. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's somewhere I like working and I still learn a lot from, um, from Brienne. I still learn a lot from the wines that we make, I, you know, and even my other coworkers here. It's just, a good group of people and you don't always know all that coming in but um, it was a great place to land for me uh, from the options I had so I was mm -hmm. like this is this is gonna be good yeah so you mentioned that you were hired kind of sort of 2020 uh, out, outside of the pandemic and going into a, a, a tricky harvest so tell me about that first year here uh, navigating the various challenges that came your way and what were sort of the decisions you had to make and what were the I guess the outcomes of those decisions. Yeah, that was a, it. Was really a doozy of harvest. I mean, that was 
that was tough because, you know, I was new here, and so I think um, doing my first harvest um, pretty much right up against harvest, like it was coming down pretty quickly. Um, you know, I was knocking a little of the dust off. Uh, you know, I'd been in a restaurant for a little bit, and um, and we're all in masks. I mean, it was very, you know, this was very, very, we're masks everywhere at this point. So trying to hear each other, um, trying to keep your mask from just becoming a glob of grape sugar and, and what, you know, just wetness and water and everything like that was really tough. And then of course the smoke um, was like, I mean, it just kind of broke your brain a little bit where what are we supposed to do with, with this situation? And, um, you know, I mean, it was probably the hardest for Brienne because she, her, this is her business and, 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 you know, working with somebody new, um, you know, we had a pretty good crew, but it wasn't a ton of people for harvest. And, um, you know, she has her, at that time, I think, two, two-year-old son, Vigo, around. And so there was just a lot of activity all day long. I think it was just um, intense. But, you know, what came out of it, and I think I still look back on this just like with uh, a huge feeling of, of awe and excitement was the, the, the lemonade rosé brand that came out of that, which, you know, making rosé from Pinot Noir is not, you know, it's not groundbreaking, but it, at the time that pivot was, um, you know, made within a couple days of, okay, we have all this rosé, all this, I'm sorry, all these um, vineyards of Pinot Noir that we, we've committed to, and we're not going to back out on it. You know, we, we wanted to honor those relationships with the growers. We knew what they'd gone through all year. Um, and, you know, the, the decision for Brienne was, how, you know, how do I make it work? And, and the, the rosé, you know, you have to change your pick dates um, to make a good rosé. You don't have to, but it's something that we did. Um, we wanted to keep that acid really bright. And um, I think running the press very gently, like almost, you know, it's all digital screen presses, but, you know, almost going, you know, every couple steps by a couple steps and cutting them off early and, you know, not letting anything go just as a standard operation, making sure, um, you know, press cycles were leaner. If anything tasted at all bad, it was gone or kept to it to the side. Um, and some of that wine actually ended up being the base for uh, an Amaro that we have, the Bambino Amaro. Um, so I think that conversation came up too, which is saying, hey, like, you know, we can, if we make alcohol, I, I think I, I can work on something here. So like, and I know she loved Amaro as well. So it's like, well, we, we, you know, we can get something together here. Like, mm -hmm. let's not, ditch this fruit we'll, we'll we'll make rosé when we can if it isn't good enough we'll find a way to distill that and have a brandy base for some kind of project you know um so yeah that was that was a it was a it was a bumpy landing you know and and um i uh, i came out of the, the harvest you know pretty worn out but thinking um while well, we really built a lot of of trust there you know mm -hmm. I, I think um yeah, you know, I couldn't put a finger on it, but I, you know, Brian and I were friends. But I, I think to be put through that together was, um, you know, you just kind of battle scarred and, and uh, like, okay, like we 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 trust each other. Now we get each other. We're we're working together, and 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 so I mean, well, the the nice thing was working on that Amaro recipe. So now I made all these promises about, uh, oh, I can I can make an Amaro, right? <laughs> it's 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 it would be hard, but um, I, I get how they're how they should taste and things like that. And, and so I spent most of that summer, we, we had the um, about 1,500 gallons of wine that couldn't get made sent up to Freeland Distillery and uh, made that into brandy. And I just spent most of the entire summer just with a pipette and, and all these different um, uh, little vials full of individual uh, fruits and, and botanicals and spices and all this stuff and just, you know, kind of measuring them all out, writing it all down, measuring them all out, writing it all down, blending it, 
wow, that does not taste good. <laughs> and then you go again, and now it's tasting a little bit better. And then you're thinking, well, it's sort of what we're talking about with blending. But the, you know, my, my own uh, motivation, me, and this is totally subjective, of course, because someone might, the Bambino Momaro might not be their favorite, but it's like, I don't want, uh, if it just tastes good, then that it isn't, I didn't get there. You know, like, how do I make it distinctive? Um, and that was really, um, you know, kind of a constant in motivation and a little pressure was, was um, putting, how do you put a personality into it, you know? And um, I think a, a thought that came to mind early was like, okay, I'm making a bitter liqueur, right? Okay, so I need bitter things. And then that wasn't, it was just tasting bitter all the time. And then when you add sweetness to it to, to sort of do a mock blend, I was like, oh, this is, uh, this is just a, a sweetened bitter thing. <laughs> this isn't good. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna switch this up to, um, I'm gonna make something that tastes good and then bitter, I'm going to bitter it, right? So, well, what are we, you know, what were we excited about? So I did a bunch of like local fruit picking and got tubs and tubs of blueberries and cherries and strawberries and then like, what are some of our favorite flavors? And we got all this juniper and, and uh, several different kinds of orange peel in there. And that sort of came from gin making was like, you know, different oranges can taste different ways. And so we use some bitter and sweet orange and things like that. Um, and by the end, I think it came out pretty good. Uh, I like it a lot. I, I mean, I, I think working at the whiskey, at the Bolton Whiskey Library, put this, because I had access to like, a back bar of like a hundred different Amara, I'm just to guess uh, how many are back there, but it's a wall of 2,000 spirits and a bunch of different Amaros. So you get to taste all these different Amaros and you're thinking, yeah, it took that Italian guy 200 years ago, a <laughs> hundred years of family blending to get this recipe, you know? Um, you know, not to say that I, I would, I wanted to at least nudge into that arena a little bit, like, well, this could be legitimately um, considered as an end of meal pour, you know, I wanted it to be strong and, and uh, knowing what, what was out there, you know, it was a bit of a gulp moment, you're like, oh, you know, it tastes Braulio, and I'm like, that's genius, I don't know how I'm supposed to get up there, but um, it was really fun, and, and uh, it's, uh, we'll see, like, I'm, I'm, I kind of don't want to say we we're going to do it again, because it would mean that we'd have wine that would need to get distilled, but we could do it again in, in a non-smoke year, just for, for mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see. So coming off of that, that is your first harvest bag. You mentioned kind of 2021 was a big, a big growth year for, for Day. So, tell, so a, whole, a whole other set of challenges. So yeah. take me through the next year, your first kind of first full year in, in back at Day. Yeah. Uh, so. That I think was also the year where we thought, oh, we 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 all got over this COVID hump, and ma like Joe Biden took his mask off on TV, <laughs> and everyone was ready to just uh, run around the countryside and have a good time, and 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 then the and then it kind of reared up again before harvest. So I think there was a little bit of you know everything was good here, and we knew we were gonna. Um, increase in size, you know, the, some of the tenants, we had about four tenants still, and uh, they had to go elsewhere because we just knew we couldn't fit enough people in. Um, and we also knew how much fruit was coming, you know, and so we, we, had, we had a fairly decent sized crew. We lost a few people, some um, went abroad uh, for good opportunities or something like that. But point being is we had a, a bit of a lean team, strong team, but um, yeah, we were, we were, motoring. I mean, that was a big, big harvest. And we, like this crush pad that I was just telling you about was, we'd hoped that it would have been done last year, but you know, so much from um, planning and funding and all these things just, it, and then you can't really start in the middle of harvest. So we had a new press that was going to go out there and, and just sort of had to live on the driveway right at the threshold of the building which went fine because it never rained. But the whole time we're like, man, what if it starts raining? Because every day it was like another 20 tons, another 35 tons, you know, just constant um, flow of fruit. And, and I think there was also this, ex 
excitement and, and, um, and sort of urgency to make the best wine we could after last year. We felt so limited last year. I mean, of course, because of the smoke, but now we have great, great fruit, um, great chemistry, uh, great weather, but a lot of it. So you're, you're trying your best to make great wine at, you know, like hyperspeed because it's just so much going on and a little bit of a lean team. So, um, yeah, that was wild. I, I, I barely remember much of it. <laughs> you know? oh, another funny story was I, I uh, have like a, you know, an adventure van, camper van thing, uh, a little kitchen in it and fold down bed. And I got it partly to use during harvest and then the engine died like right before it so had to go in the, the shop for like a month or two, you know, they had, to, they had to put a new one in and that was right, you know, right during harvest. But we had such long days that I had to stay out here sometimes. So I, had, I, had to, I had to use a tent just like in this little spot in the woods back there. And uh, at first I thought, well, it won't be that bad. Like we have a shower here, but trying to go to bed after all that. And then what I didn't realize is there's a lot of trucking at like two in the morning. And so the, all these uh, tractor trailers are blowing by, you know, and you're hearing like crackling noises in the woods and there's probably cats and coyotes and raccoons. I don't know what else. So I, it was really hard to get um, to sleep and even just comfortable. Like, I don't, I don't want to be camping at work. <laughs> so you know, I was really missing that, that van. Um, so hopefully this, this summer my van will break down. I can bring it down here. But that just made it all the more like, you know, you wake up and you'd be like, oh, I feel uh, like I was hit by one of those trucks and now I have to work, you know, straight through to the next night. So, yeah, some big ones. But the wine is something I think we're all um, thrilled with. I mean, you know, the, the, the pain fades and you're like, wow, this is really, this is great. So I think, you know, Brian and I and, and, and the whole team here, Layla and Tanai and all that have just been thrilled with each bottle, each time we bottle, because you sort of remember that harvest and how big it was, and and um, and of course the 2020. So you have that in the back of your mind too, and and so there's just a lot of excitement each time we put a new wine in mm -hmm. in, in bottle. It really is just like a genuine, uh, you know, belief in the air about oh we got it, you know. So you kind of don't take it for granted going forward. So I think it's you know sort of how I feel with with starting the Mendivia thing too. It's like, I'm excited to start it, but you, like, you, I'm thinking of it just at one harvest at a time because we're in sort of a new reality. It's like, I want to get a good one in and then it just, you, you just have to wait and see what you get next year. So mm -hmm. you're a little more on your, on, your, on your toes all the time now, yeah. Well, on that note, you mentioned that Mendivia had been something that was kind of in the back of your mind for a while and you weren't sure exactly the timeline. So what prompted you to start it when you did and tell us about getting it off the ground and, and sort of the, in the initial stages of it. Yeah, I mean, my, my you know, the work at, at day is, is super important to me and, and, um, and you know, I wanna definitely keep my, my attention really strong there, but I, so I think it was um, knowing that, um, you know, my connection with Brienne and the business was strong and that we had good trust with each other. Um, and then, you know, just explaining to her my interest in having um, a, a creative outlet there, you know? Um, and, you know, I think she's been very supportive, which is, is very fortunate. You know, it's not something that she has to do or, or, or that I was sure would be the case, but, um, it, it's uh, it's really exciting to have her not supporting but even helping you know so I think some of the the fruit that I've been able to get even recently has come through her encouragement and then even some trips we've taken and things like that so you know being able to go down south and meet some vineyards um, in the Applegate which I don't always you know would have time for or or maybe wouldn't know about and then um, you know uh, talking with her about, you know, well, do you think this would go better? Or what do you think of this idea? You know, it's, it just makes it more fun. And, and um, so, yeah, and, you know, for me, I don't know if I will make a Pinot Noir, but I definitely wanted to open without one, right? So that, that was a goal. Um, it's not in any way a rejection of Pinot Noir, but 
it was something I was seeing in, in these other regions, like the Gorge and, and the Applegate, was that excitement of, of that, that newness and that growth that you know maybe the Willamette Valley had um, when I came out here. Um, but also the kinds of grapes that I, I really like working with, and I'm not gonna say better or anything like that. <laughs> you know, I just said it, but it's, it's um, they give you an opportunity to, to choose um, what could be the, the future of those areas, and it's very exciting. So like, I think when I look at, you know, like the Ebro River Valley and La Rioja, and you look at the gorge, they're not that wildly different. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the other grapes um, that I'm looking at down south as well, there's some Tempranillo and some Grenache, uh, and uh, possibly like a Cab Franc Gamay blend as well. So I think that kind of fills it out. Quite, it, it's all kind of happened fairly quickly, but um, I think I'll be able to open with a pretty good collection of wines, with, you know, and, and paste them out. So that was another thing I wanted to have of several early releases, uh, months apart from each other, and um, that's not easy to, to do when, you know, as a new winemaker, you're you're sort of fielding what what you can get, like you know, and especially after a frost, there isn't people offering up that much fruit, understandably. So it's it's. Uh, what you can get your hands on, but like within your, like you're talking about your philosophies or your goals. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to just add any old grape just because it was available. It was staying with um, that sort of Spanish central theme. Um, so yeah, it's going to be really fun. The first will be a, a, a Tempranillo Rosé from, from Washington um, in the Gorge area. And then I think Grenache Rosé and then that Cap Franc Gamay blend and then I, I'd really like to give those Tempranillo wines sometimes they're over vintage and fully mature. Um, uh, Tempranillo is obviously a tricky one so I, I want to make sure I get those ferments dialed to that grape variety correctly and, and aging to suit the kind of tannins that, that can come out in a wine like that. So, so give us an idea on the as as you're putting it into kind of fruition of uh, getting all of the kind of your ducks in a row in terms of like the name and what what grapes you're going to use. You mentioned it was kind of you know always kind of tricky to find and and an idea of like release schedule and how it would fit into the rest of your life. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's a good question it, it, because you know I think that to your last question like once that wine ends up in bottle your life sort of changes a little bit. And I, you know my experience with Oso and owning a business, I, I'm, you know, I, I can remember certain things about like how it's, it becomes a little bit of a 24-hour, you know, 24/7 project. Um, you're always linked to it. But um, you know, my, my wife and I are, are working together on some building and splitting up some duties as far as marketing and, and back end and things like that. Um, yeah, with the ducks in a row. You know, it's sort of like, you know, I, I, the way I'm trying to keep myself focused is sort of the, the old, like, what's important now thing. It's like, I, I can't worry too much about what needs to happen in 2022 right now, but, um, and considering there's a period of about two months where I can barely be reached with harvest, uh, things like, well, what takes a long time? Well, art can take a long time. So I'm working with this really great artist, um, Luke Busser, who does, um, typewriter based art so it uses a lot of patterns based on like a basically an old um, you know analog typewriter and stuff comes out beautifully um, and you know there are things that make it easier when you're already in a winery like glass you can just have larger orders and things like that but I think um, that when we we're talking earlier about you know not getting in the way of the vineyard um, Picking the right vessels, you know, not trying to save money early, but hoping you come out with something great. You know, what I mean, so mm -hmm. if you don't, if you aren't selective about the barrels and the way they're treated, and 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 or the tank you get and things like that, it it's harder to get that wine to the place you want it to be. So there, you know, there's investment up front that mm -hmm. that's, you know, sometimes you, you know. It stinks a little bit, but you got to get 
you got to get good stuff. I, I mean, it's it, it, certain things. It's hard to get around. You know, like if, if you, you know, a barrel is essentially a porous, you know, vessel, and and it, you just have to have a good program, good choices, and you know, even with neutral barrels, I feel like you can still taste that that forest influence or the toast influence that that it started with, um, even several you know several years down the road. So, just taking any old barrel that's available, um, you know, can knock you back a few steps so I'm trying to pay attention to each one of those details when they come up if I can so so take me take me through then kind of the the future plan for yourself you have uh, obviously a day job here and, and, the, and the brand starting up so as you look ahead for yourself the next few years what are you sort of foreseeing and what are you kind of hoping for yeah I'd like to keep the brand here made at day for as long as I can I really like you know my, my job which is um, uh, a good feeling and and it can be a rare feeling you know I think you you learn it as you get older too where um, the you know the I think the more you like something and get experience with it sometimes your options are more limited because you, you know you only want to do it in a certain way at a certain place right um, so I do really like this place and and the the wine label does it need to grow infinitely? I just want it to to be. Um, a, I want it to. I want it to. I guess satisfy a the, that creative urge. You know what I mean. So it, it's um, somewhere there's. You know, a scale that measures how much I can fit in here, and and I don't necessarily need to find that limit. But I I. I, you know, I love working with with, the, with day wines. I love what's coming up for Mendivia, and, and I like the idea of them both being in the same family, not you know having room for each other. So I think that's more than possible. And then outside of that, um, you know, I, I think that there's. I mean, it, it would be a way way out there idea, I guess, but trying to segue that into some international connections with other vineyards and, and the idea of in some way having an international wine project at some point I think would be very very thrilling um, I don't know how 100% that works out but it's I think it's one of those things where you think gosh I would do that if or if only this other thing and, and I try to keep it as a, as a possibility. It seems very difficult, but it would be really cool to bring some extension of that project back to Spain in some way and see what, what that would be like to to find vineyards to work with and, and extend the brand in a small way to a place like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, it just seems like a really interesting pathway for a, for a wine label. So yeah, I guess... <laughs> Stay modest here in the building, but also try and grow internationally. <laughs> it's the classic. It's the classic yeah. tale you hear it all the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, be content, but also try and get everything you can somewhere else. <laughs> so. I mean, but in all, in all seriousness, it's it's not. It's kind of indicative of of the industry because, like, I think the people who are in the position you're in are always thinking of like, what is the what is the biggest thing I could aim for? What is the thing that'll keep me driving? So I think that's, that's, a, that's a really cool thing to be aiming for. Yeah, it's a good motivation. Also, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a different motivation um, than just have your, your project just keep growing vertically. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, um, what, if, what if my, you know, it's sort of like the idea of the like, um, you know, work, work smarter, not harder kind of thing, I hope. Or it's like, you don't have to just add more on your shoulders. You can find new ideas. I mean, who knows? Maybe it works into um, some importing as well. You know, things like that. I just don't know. But I like the idea of using it to connect um, within the the global industry to places I, I might have just ignored because it seemed too far, or or it seemed like um, oh, I can't do that because I'm I've got too much to do here. Uh, that would, be, that would be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, you brought up kind of your initial impressions of Oregon and your first couple of years in the, in the work, and that's, you know, 
almost 20 years now around the industry. So tell me, tell me what has changed in Oregon wine and what it looks like to you now in 2022. Yeah. Well, there there was a time in the, in the middle, maybe like the the late 2000s, teens, something like that, where it seemed to get a little homogenized. Uh, and someone could probably speak a little more directly as to why or what you know that. So the, I guess the reason I bring it up is I thought, oh well, maybe it's sort of plateaued, and and then all all these wine labels started coming out experimenting with um, exciting grape varieties and exciting techniques and, and, and you know, even just vineyard practices that were different and really driving home the biodynamic uh, uh, approach and, and all that. So it sort of just became a, like what's very old is new again. You know, it's like using the earth and I think even to a degree like taking that sort of vertical ambition idea out of it, you know, which, you, you know, you could, it's sort of a capitalist approach or whatever, you know, not in a bad way. I mean, we, we're, it's a cap, we, we are in that system of making money, but it's the, also a mentality of like, you, you have to keep getting bigger, you have to keep making more, um, but can, you know, can there be room for very creative groups mm -hmm. as well in there. And that seems to be what happened, whether it was naturally or, or, or if larger places changed what they were doing, uh, probably a mix of both. But um, yeah, for, for a while there, I was like, well, you know, distilling might really be where I can have more fun. Um, because really, yeah, I mean, there, there's a reason you get into wine or spirit. I mean, you, you Ha you're trying to enjoy life a little more than maybe some other job options. I don't want to speak on anyone else's job choices, but th this isn't like, you know, um, it's, a, it's a strange job in a way, you know, but it's really fun. So you pick it because it brings an excitement to you that you might not get elsewhere. So um, that started to seem more realistic. Um, and now for a while, I mean, hopefully it, it's sort of stuck where I think both I won't say both, but every type of winemaking that has risen to the top in Oregon so far has room to do what it, what it wants in its way, like, you know, very classic style um, and, you know, sort of that Europhile ap approach or that sort of chateau thing is, is very fun as well and very um, successful, but there's room and an audience for uh, sort of things that we're doing here at day, and it's, and you can see it in in the way people come to the tasting room and and the kind of questions they ask. It, it, it it's sort of like, well, what's in the deck? What what's interesting? What like, how did you how did this come out? You know, in in a bottle. I haven't had anything like that before. You know, and for me, I I guess I look to the wine regions that I like as well, and I still love a classic Burgundy. You know, but if if someone has a, you know, out of AOC creative, you know, thing, and every so often you get to see him over here, that, um, you know, maybe some guy likes to do a skin contact aligote and somehow it, you know, ends up over here, that's exciting as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just glad that it's, it's, all, it's, hap it's all happening at the same time here, and I think that that's how you become a, a, a true global wine scene is, is to say, it's fully realized. It's it's or it's always moving. You know, if you're one small niche, um, or if you're trying to define yourself by one thing, you, it becomes re reduced over time. It, you know, in a caricature after a while. So, um, yeah, I think I'm almost you can think of maybe like a like a town becoming a city in a way. Like it becomes bigger, and some people complain that there's more of this that. But you now we are becoming more of like a that city mindset where multiple levels are are staying strong and thriving and and mm -hmm. hopefully appreciating each other all at the same time so um, I, I, that's my take on it and I hope that that's the case and it seems to be um, especially as I think younger people enter and don't have a sense of like the mid 90s and early 2000s it's just like I, I, I like this one I like that one I like going to both and 
this one has a food cart sometimes, and it's really fun to go have that wine with those tacos. And, and um, you know, and, and we've started doing that as well to get these, like, exciting... Um, this brick oven pizza group comes and we get music. And, and I like that because it, it just gives people an option to have the best day that they want to at whichever place, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you want the very fancy one and sometimes you want the live music one, <laughs> right? So. Mm -hmm. And so what comes next then? You mentioned kind of in your mind kind of a period of like homogeneity and, and, and all, this, all this kind of burst of creativity. What does the industry look like down the road? Mm. God, I wish I knew. I mean, it's, uh, speculation's always tough. Um, easily proven wrong, but I, I do, you know, not to bring a bummer into it, but the climate's really gonna predict what, what, what we do. Um, without that, it would be great to see I think, I mean, for me, for my approach, just the valley to go more vineyard health driven. And, you know, just to come back to that point of more emphasis put on more dynamic ways to, to grow and care for vineyards in, in like a sustainable way. Um, I do think that it would be great to see um, you know, the culture diversity in, in the industry grow. Um, I don't know really the solutions for that. Um, um, and we, we, we do try and we keep, you know, reaching out and things like that. But, you know, there's a, there's a pretty strong pipeline, I think, of, of a certain type of person. And, and, you know, it is an expensive um, uh, business to enter into and things like that. But um, it's great to see different people taking taking it on and, and doing great things with it so um yeah I, I think i you know it's it's hard to say because i think just as a person i i try to avoid predicting things but it's it's uh it is kind of driven by by climate stuff a little bit i feel like unfortunately so um but we're, you know, we're resilient and, you know, vineyards can change and things like that. I, hopefully we don't tip into, you know, wines are made in much hotter areas than this as well, so we can find ways. But, um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, just great wine and great people. I, you know, <laughs> what else can you ask for? It's just, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, happier vineyards all the time, so. So we talked about what comes next for, for kind of your work life. I'm curious, looking ahead for yourself outside of wine, what, anything else on the horizon for you that you're excited about? Any projects or travels or anything else that you're kind of excited about in the future? Yeah. Well, um, gosh, what else am I excited about? Um, I mean, my, my wife and I are really working on, um, uh, her name's Holly too, uh, on kind of getting, a, uh, a little bit more of a a simpler lifestyle at our house and even like we're Airbnb being part of our property and um, trying to find ways to get you know I, it's not it's not like a, a retirement thing but a like freedom of time and independence of time and and not such a a, a resource-driven lifestyle going, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to talk about, but the actual, the, 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 the making of it happen is a lot of work in itself. So um, trying to find ways to, to open up, not just, you know, like I'm talking about the Mendivia stretching internationally at some point, you know, um, but even our own, um, connections and, and, you know, maybe with some real estate, things like that, I think would be really exciting. So I'll mention another friend who has been an inspiration there, which is Ted Seastead, the way he's, uh, you know, years ago he was telling me about, he has this little place in Liguria, and, um, yeah, I think I was like, oh, that's cool. 
And then I started thinking, you know, the more I sort of just put myself in, in, maybe not his perspective, but if I was in his shoes, what am I thinking about? You know, he's working with a guy. I've had his, the olive oil they bottle, it's brilliant. Um, so I guess that's sort of what I'm trying to put into words, which, which is like these interesting opportunities that lay beyond the normal scope of, of what you might. So it's like, if you say, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we did this, even if it's not, it might not be an expensive thing, but it might seem outside your normal realm of, of activities and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, why not have a Spanish olive oil brand? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or, or um, yeah, a small apartment in, in, uh, in you know, your favorite city, some, wherever. But I think these ideas of, of trying to um, make our lives more fluid and exciting when we want it to be and not feel too, too pinned down. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a general idea, I guess. There's no major plans yet, but I mean, we, we put a lot of conversation and talk in, into it, so um, I guess that's the next project. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's, a, it's a, a noble goal, if nothing else. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it is. It is ultimately sort of. It, it is a bit self-centered. It's a bit self-driven. You know, so I, I think we we do keep that in mind. Which is, you know, um, whether you're moving around the globe or not, you're still part of a community, and and you have to find ways to 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 help to to um, show active care back to. To people, you know, because mm -hmm. that would, would be, you know, let's say you're Airbnb or you have a apartment that you rent in, in some place, you know, like we were just in Mexico last summer and just a couple that had this little tiny, you know, second floor apartment on the coast that we were staying in um, were, it seemed a lot like us, you know, we were, we were, we felt like we were talking to our friends and, and trying to learn from just absorbing that experience and, and um, you know, they're, using local staff and, or, you know, hiring local staff to help clean and, you know, recommending local businesses and things like that. You know, these are small things, but I think it's like not wanting to like check out of, of society. It's mm -hmm. just expand and, and get to know more about, um, you know, there's a lot going on out there. It's, it's fun to go visit it. And, but, you know, not, you know, avoid the Marriott if you can, like go to, go to, go to a place that's, you know, local and, and, and is helping, you know, young people or whoever mm -hmm. of that area stay employed and have a good time and whatever, so. All right, so the questions that I have for you, uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have, uh, anything we didn't cover here today that you would have liked to have covered? Um, nothing comes to mind. I feel like I talked a lot. <laughs> Perfect amount. Yeah, okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, no, I really appreciate you guys doing this. I think it's exciting. I, I'll, I'll look forward to having some wine in, in bottle to share with everybody here and your team and, and uh, see how it's all, all coming out. And um, yeah, I appreciate you being interested. It mm -hmm. really means a lot. So, so you're welcome, and thank you for that. And uh, we appreciate your stories today. You're hosting us in this very cool spot on a very hot day. So yeah. thank you for that as well. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Cheers. Thanks, Rich. Thank you.